You got your phone. It's not up here. It's not here. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. All right. I hope you're ready for a great lesson here. No matter what I do, it's God's Word, so that makes it great. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to continue our series on love God and love people. Obviously, it will be a special edition one today, and we will talk about, uh, the title is, Love God and Love Your Mother. Amen? Amen. There's a lot to cover here today, so let's jump on in. You'll see a scripture up on the screen there, Ephesians 6, verse 2. You know, as disciples of Jesus, our mission on this earth is to evangelize the nations in our generation. Amen? And yet, we need preparation as individuals to make that happen. And I believe some of the greatest lessons that we learn to prepare our hearts for this great task is to have a lesson from mom today. And yet Ephesians 6.2 says, Honor your father and your mother, amen, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. That's a great promise right there, you know. There's actually two great promises here. Uh, now, you notice that that scripture doesn't say, honor your mother if. Yeah. There's no if in there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and yet, our human nature is to only honor if we feel like we should so. And yet, God says right here, let me tell you what, if you want to enjoy long life, if you want things to go well in your life, then you just flat honor your mother and your father, amen? And yet, I believe this is an area that we should be called higher in. We can always be called higher in honoring one another. And yet, I believe we need to be called higher in honoring our mothers today. Can I get an amen from the moms on that? I know you all agree with that, right? Because we get critical of our moms. We get resentful toward our mothers. Some of us may even utter the words, she's always on my case. And yet, it's because you need her on your case. <laughs> But you know, I think every one of us has dishonored our mother or our father at some point in life. And it's amazing how we can engage like that and then wonder why life isn't going well for us. Wonder why nothing seems to work out. Well, it's because God gave us a promise it won't work out if we don't honor our father and our mother. And yet if you honor your mother life will go well with you and you will enjoy your life here on earth how did your lo mother love you growing up you know there's varying answers to that many of us had great mothers growing up like myself um, many, many many lost their mothers early on or maybe their mothers weren't there for you and yet I still have yet to find the individual who God did not send some mother figure in their life to love them and show them uh, the love of a mother. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. As a true bona fide mama's boy, right along with Corey, I'd like to share how our mothers love both of us, Corey and myself. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God, who tests our hearts. You know that we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, or from you, or from anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. 
You know, moms are approved by God. Because they're not looking for your praise. They're eager to share their lives. And they work day and night tirelessly for you. And that is an approved love that comes only from God. Amen. For me, I'm so lucky that this is the way my mother loved me. Everything good, faithful, everything inside me that is sacrificial, loyal. When I became a disciple of Jesus, the ability to die to yourself for the will of God, I learned from my mother dying for me, dying to her will for my best interest. And you know, uh, my mother taught me to bear the fruit of God's Spirit. And she taught me to bear the fruit of disciples. I did not meet my mother and convert her. She met me and converted me. She is the most fruitful older woman that I've ever seen in the church. And uh, I love you with all my heart. I'm so honored to be your son. And I'm so grateful for all that you gave up for me growing up. My mother literally took beatings, physical beatings for me. And uh, I am always grateful for you and indebted to you. You have made every good thing inside me as a man has come from you. Come on, dude. <laughs> a poem about a mother's abiding love. I've been with you since before your birth. I'll stand by your side as long as I'm on this earth. A mother's love is a special, never-ending gift, a love that's always there if you ever need a lift. I think of you often, never missing a day. My love is forever and always sent your way. You're never far from the caring thoughts in my heart, no matter how many miles ever try to keep us apart. A mother's love, your gift, the gift I will always give to you as we watch our lives go by, no matter what you say or do. That is the way a mother loves. You know, God gave us mothers as examples of how true the believers are to love one another and how true believers are to love a lost world so they can find their father in heaven. Amen. I've got four aspects of loving God and loving people today. Our first point is love God because he gave you a mother's love. Go to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Love God because he gave you a mother's love through someone. Luke 2 verse 8. The birth of Jesus. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth. Peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what he had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary, see Jesus' mother, treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. Let's go down over to verse 41. A mother ponders everything about their child deep in their heart. And yet, sometimes children don't totally obey their mothers. 
like what we see right here. Verse 41. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. You ever had your child take off, right? Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Hope none of our moms have ever done that one. But then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking these questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Did you not know I was in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then they went down to Nazareth with them, and finally, okay, he was obedient to them. Amen. <laughs> Even in, his, even in not doing something that pleased them, check out her response. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in the favor of God and of men. You know, mothers always know from the moment they see their child or feel their child inside that they're going to be someone great. That they're going to do something great. And they treasure everything that happens to or around their child deep in their heart. And that is the core of a mother's love. Mothers, do you remember when your child or your children were born? The dreams that you had. The vision. The hope. The peace. All mothers know there's something special about their child. And yet everyone is someone's child. Yeah. Everyone needs a disciple of Jesus to look at them and love them like a mother loved them and know they're special in God's eyes even more. You know, even children that are born with challenges, try and find a mother who thinks their baby's ugly. <laughs> it just ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. They are precious in every single way with a mother. And yet I have to wonder if we view each other in this special way. As mothers and fathers in the faith, and certainly it's great to have our mother and father in the faith, Kip and Elena, here with us today. And it's phenomenal to have Southland's mother and father in the faith, Corey and G, here with us. Still. Corey and G have looked at all of you in this way, have loved all of you in this way, have believed in all of you in this way. See you, each, every one of you. He's, I've heard it out of his mouth for a year now, how special each and every one of you are to him. And I hear it from G, how much she loves each and every one of you. You know, the only way to honor that is to go and love others that same way. And yet there's a lesson for us on how to love. How to have vision. Let me ask you a question about the lost individuals of this world. I thought RD did a great job and contribution, helping focus our hearts and minds there on the lost. What if your child was lost? How hard would you search for them? What would you give up for them? What would you do to find them? You know, we had... Uh, Almost 30 people go out and do what we call tagging yesterday. And, you know, the morning session had 17, and I'm not sure exactly how many were in the, uh, in the afternoon session, but, gosh, from 8.30 in the morning till 7 at night, out there on the street corner with signs, with music, screaming, yelling, running. What would a mother do to save their child? That's what the heart of this church has for the lost children of this world. And it's an amazing, amazing thing to watch. People who tag humble themselves to show others how much they love this lost world. And I'm proud of every one of you for stepping up to do that. But what about your roommate? 
What about the person who's doing worse spiritually in our church in your eyes? What about that person that maybe might rub you the wrong way when you walk through the door? The question is, are you, are you going to love that person that's right here next to you now as well? See, Mary pondered all things about her child. And she stored them deep in her heart and treasured them. You know, she didn't just treasure the good things. She treasured the bad things and used those as a catalyst to find an amazing thing that that child would do with it. We've got to be those disciples who notice everything about one another. And take the good and encourage about it and take the bad and love past that. To know that we will all do great things in this world. Amen. There's nothing like a mother's love. Let's have that love for one another today. Amen. Second, secondly, our second point, turn to Mark chapter 3. Love your mother because of her involvement. Mark 3 verse 1. There's an intense scene that we're going to read here. You imagine as Mary pondered everything in her heart... I doubt if she would knew that there a, a time would come when crowds of people would want to kill her son. And yet we see Jesus' response knowing their hearts, and yet the love of her mother and the, his mother and the involvement that she shows here is phenomenal. Mark 3, verse 1. Another time he went up to the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath, like that was a bad thing. Right. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, ah, Stand up in front of everybody. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? Of course, they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Ooh, it's getting intense. Going down on to verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. You know, your mom will get really mad if people keep you from eating, let me tell you. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, and they said, he's out of his mind. See, they knew and heard that, he was gonna, that they were plotting to kill him. And here he is standing against all of that. They go, he's out of his mind, he's going to get himself killed. It says, and the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said to him, He's possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Woo, it's getting pretty hot. Wow. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. And the end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth. All the sins and the blasphemies of men will be forgiven. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. And he is guilty of an eternal sin. Jesus just went after him. He said this because they're saying he had an evil spirit. <laughs> Woo! What do you say when people persecute you? Well, then comes Jesus' mother. So, of course, all this craziness is going on. All these people are talking about killing somebody. And where's a, where's a son's mother going to be? Right all in the middle of it. You know what I'm talking about? Verse 31, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrive. Standing outside, they sent someone in, to, someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around them, and they told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside looking for you. Shocking response. Who are my mothers and brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And the church said...
You know, this was a distressing situation. People talking about killing a mother's son. And his response to look at them in anger and distress and just flat go after them. Boy, they're, boy I, I bet her heart just sunk. Wow. Imagine her demeanor. <laughs> people talking about killing her son. Crowds of people watching her son stand against hundreds, maybe thousands of people at once. I bet her demeanor was hot. She was like all in the middle of that stuff. Of course she was going to take charge of him. She was afraid they were going to kill him. Boy, if you ever want to incur a, brother's, a mother's wrath, start talking about her child. You know, if you want to get yourself killed, plot to harm that child. You're darn right she was taking charge. And yet how many mothers have gone after protecting us? You know, it makes me think of my wife. And, uh... You know, my son Devin is an incredible young man, and he had challenges in school. People would pick on him. People blamed him for things and, that he didn't do, and uh, uh, he had a lot of challenges. And so, at first, his response would be uh, to just take it in the classroom, but then they'd go out for recess. Everybody set up for the kickball game, and he'd just run and grab the ball. Gone! <laughs> and here's Devin just running. Woo! And he's fast and nobody can catch him now running around the park and, and you know we get calls daily and, and Tracy you know had the involvement of a mother where people were harming her child and she went down there to the school and was large and in charge at the school district you know what I'm saying because that's what a mom does is they get involved and so she was there every day and, uh, and, you know, we, we move heaven and earth so that she could stay home with the kids. And, and yet she was there day after day. Okay, honey, give them the ball back. All right. Now just get in line and you're going to go next. And, and she taught him social skills where he lacked. And she was there so much they gave her a job and just hired her. Because she took care of not just Devin, all the kids on the park. And so how about it, disciples? You know, we have this incredible thing that we do in the church called discipling, right? Where we get involved in each other's lives. Where we talk about and find out about where we are disobeying God. And our charge in discipling is to help one another be obedient to everything Jesus commanded. Matthew 28, 20. And yet, how about it? Are you really getting involved? You know, of course it's quiet because that's not really happening the way it needs to be in our church here. And I think it's time that today be the day that turns around, amen? Today we learn the lesson from our mothers on how to get involved and how to be there for one another and how to help one another through our challenging things. It's time to call us higher. You know, when, uh, when Devin was abused to such a degree that his story was on the news, they didn't use my interview, they used Tracy's. Because a mother cares, and a mother will do anything for her child. Today, let's learn from each other how to be more obedient. Let's show a reverence toward one another, a respect for God and for each other. Let's learn, even in service. Uh, I, I, I do have to say, I was, I was a little disappointed that uh, Chris had to speak over us during the time of communion. Uh, that, that should be just like instant. He, when communion comes, reverence. And, and, uh, and we need to learn that from each other. And, uh, and we need to learn how to be on time and sit close to one another. Yes, yes. And so let's, in our discipling times, help one another and teach one another so we can take these services and just take them to the highest point so we can get these rooms filled. Amen. <laughs> Love your mother because of her involvement and learn to be like her in that way. Thirdly, Love God because he gave you a mother's vision. John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 1. I love this story. It reminds me of many interactions between my mother and I. John 2, verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And Jesus, and when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, uh, Son, they have no more wine. 
And you just got to kind of picture this, you know, the wedding's going on and everything. And, and we also know from other scriptures that Jesus did miracles in private, and his brothers even challenged him to go do them publicly. And yet, right here, you see, mom said, it's time. And, and so the wedding's going on there, and everything's good, and then we run out of wine. And, you know, obviously they had CR issues in the first century, because that, that was a really big deal. Everything came to a halt there, because the wine was gone. So she looks over and goes, son, there's no more wine. It is time. This ain't good. <laughs> Now, Jesus' response, Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus, my time, Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. You know, it's just pretty interesting that the Son of Man, God on earth, His plan up to that moment was not to reveal Himself yet. And yet, a mom knows best, does she not? <laughs> And so, you just got to picture the interaction of mom maybe tapping her foot. And, okay, son. It's time. He says it's not time. Well, Jesus says it's not time. What does mom say? His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> Jesus is like, no. Mom says, hey, guys, yes. They say, yes. Go for it. <laughs> Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. So we know this wasn't like clean, Nestle, pure drinking water. Each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the wine that had been, the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it came from. Can you imagine the dude with the cup? <laughs> He's like, ooh, those are jars are all dirty. Ooh, baby, here you go. <laughs> so he tastes it. He doesn't know where it comes from. And, and then he says here, then the oh, sorry, he real he did not realize where it came from, though the servants had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, "Everyone who brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now." They were probably going, "Amen, fired up." This was the first of the miraculous signs Jesus had performed in Cana in Galilee. You know, Jesus was not ready to show the world who he was. Yet, mom knew it was time, and he was the guy to do it. Amen. Embarrassing moments with your mother. <laughs> you know, uh, it's funny, every time we move, we've moved uh, nine times in the, last, uh, in the last eight years, and yet, every time we move, all the people are moving all the stuff, and mom's got my baby pictures out, showing everybody. <laughs> And mom, it's time to move. No, honey, it's, it's time to let everybody see your pictures. <laughs> and, and you know, everybody's just always encouraged. Yeah. And yet moms just innately know the right time for the right thing. What people need in the moments. We know what needs to be done, but moms know what people need during those times. And we've got to learn to have the vision of a mother loving her child. When I was growing up, I, I grew in a, I grew up in a, a in an incredible home, and um, it was a home filled with uh, Hell's Angels bikers and people that, and black folks that listened to Lou Rawls. And you got Lou Rawls playing in one room, Twisted Sister, Rat, all kinds of heavy metal in the other room. And uh, it was just a melting pot where different races came together. And yet there were times of uh, great conflict where my white cousins would hate my black cousins and vice versa. And there was one particular time we were having a big party and they were going at each other. And uh, I just kind of got tired of it. And so I stood up on the table and I started telling everyone, you know, you're black and you don't expect them because they're white. You're white, you don't accept them because they're black. Well, what am I? None of you accept me because I'm none of it. And I'm all of it. In a thousand years, everybody's going to look like me, so you better get used to it. And, you know, I don't know what came over me, but, you know, my uncle that day said, you know what, that young man's going to stand in front of thousands of people and they're going to listen to him, is what he told my mom. And my mom never let me live that down. And yet, you know, 
that played into me becoming a preacher. It really did, because my mom always pondered that moment in her heart deeply and always kept throwing that back at me all the time. Even, even when I wanted nothing to do with God, nothing to do with His people, I would come home every day, and I would sit down in my same spot I sat, and I'd have my dinner, and there would be a little red Bible that sat on the table right there every day. And I would take that Bible, and I would chuck it over my shoulder into the back of the room, and every day it would be reappear right where I ate. And it was tore up before I ever looked at a single word in that Bible. But that was my mom's vision for me. That not only would I become a disciple, Disciple, but that she would raise a preacher. And I thank you for that. See, a mother's vision transcends all flaws. It transcends all shortcomings, anything that's wrong. And we've got to learn today to have vision for each other. We've got to have learned to have vision for our church. We've got to learn to have vision for our movement and pay attention to what God is doing all over the world because we are going to win this world in this generation. Amen? We've got to have a mother's vision. Lastly, love your mother because of her everlasting devotion. Go to Acts chapter 1. When all was said and done, Jesus died, was buried, and then ascended back into heaven. And even after he was gone, one of the greatest moments came the day the church started. Acts chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. There present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. You know, uh, after they did kill her son, and she was right there the entire way through, all the disciples may have fled, but you bet Jesus' mother didn't. She was right there the whole time. He said all will fall away, but not his mother. Not his mother. This was one of the most important meetings of all mankind of all time. Thousands upon thousands following Jesus, and there's only 120 left. But you bet one of those 120 was his mother, and you also bet she had his brothers right there with her. Even when Jesus was gone and ascended, she stayed devoted not only to him, but to his plan to win the world. Can you imagine that at the end of that day? You know, we had two incredible baptisms here today. I thought it was phenomenal. I mean, Cindy, we love you with all of our heart. You are part of our family. And Cynthia, you are amazing. And we know Edgar's coming next. Amen? He already talked to me. We're doing it this week. And, and yet... That was two baptisms today. Amen. I want you to consider the first day our church started. Yeah. 3,000 baptized. You know, even once it gets, it's almost 12, right? And all you're starting to look at your clock. Okay, it's time to go to dinner, encourage mom. Well, what if we had like 2,998 more baptisms to go? You know? But I want you to consider Jesus' mother now. How proud of you, how proud of Jesus do you think she was? Every one of those baptisms. He died for you, and 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 for you. My mom made me a Trekkie before I was even born. When she was pregnant with me still in 1969, she would watch Star Trek every night. And the moment I was born, I watched Star Trek. 
And, and you know, it's an interesting thing. I love the Star Trek movies, but I love the latest Star Trek and the interaction with Spock and his mom. The entire race of Vulcans were ashamed of him and not his mom. In the moment of his death, looking in his eyes, I am always proud of you. Always proud of you. You know, some of you have your mother sitting here today. You're very lucky that they're here with you. If your mom's here, I want you to look at your mom right now. Because in every way possible, she has said how proud of you she is from the day you were born until right now. Honor that woman. Honor that woman. If your mom is not here, go find her and honor her today. Because of the lessons your mother or your mother figure has taught you growing up, God's made you the way you are. But he's made you not just to be the way you are. He's made you to be a spiritual mother to someone. Everyone on this planet not only needs a physical mom, but a spiritual mom. I'm lucky enough that mine is both. And yet, I want you to remember our points today. Love God because he gave you a mother's love. Love your mother because of her involvement. I. Love God because he gave you a mother's vision, V. And love your mother because of her everlasting devotion, E. My prayer is that each one of you today will honor your mother so your life will go well with you, so you will enjoy, but also so that you will always remember your mother and our Father in heaven taught you how to live today. And with that, let's take this to the entire world. I love you all very much. Have an awesome Mother's Day. Let's thank our brother Ron for an incredible lesson from God's Word today. You know, um, that lesson certainly was an upward call to us all, but uh, it was uh, quite a tribute, I think, uh, to Judy. And uh, sis, what, what an incredible mom you are. Uh, and 